Okay, I think we're all set. Um, thank you for joining us tonight for our last uh, cafe of, the, of this academic year. We'll be starting up again in the fall. Um, it's hard to believe we've been doing this for five years now. If you're looking for something interesting to do this summer, both Camp Naco and the Springerville Heritage Center and the site of Casa Malpais make great uh, heritage tourism destinations. So take a visit if you're interested. So with that said, uh, I think we'll just go ahead and, and I'd like to introduce Louis Bork. This is one of the neatest things about archaeology cafes is when we can get current research right out of the field and right into the restaurant. So here we go. Louis, take it away. <laughs> Thanks. So it is really right out of the field into the restaurant. I think we finished up two weeks ago. So uh, a lot of this is preliminary, but it's uh, hopefully will be interesting. Uh, to start off, though, I want to take a, a brief moment and, and mention something. They had... Uh, about three weeks ago, um, myself and my crew and, and all the volunteers that were out in the field with us were, were lucky enough to be able to stay at uh, um, the Malpai Ranch, which is right on the border of um, Arizona and New Mexico down at the U.S.-Mexico border. And, uh, and we're the guests of Wendy Glenn and Warner Glenn, uh, two uh, pretty amazing people. Um, and Warner's fairly famous, and, and Wendy should be fairly famous because she was... Uh, uh, quite, an, quite an individual, but um, these two together are, I think, were two of the most captivating and engaging uh, folk that I've ever had the pleasure of meeting, and, and we just found out that Wendy had, and she, they let it stay on their property um, overnight and used it as a staging area for our field work, and, and we just found out uh, recently that Wendy has passed away in the last couple of days, so uh, so I just wanted to take a moment for, of silence for, for Wendy and all the, all the help that she's given Archaeology Southwest and the, and the project itself. Then on top of uh, that kind of thanks for the Glens and everything that they've done, I also want to thank everyone who is out in the field with us and, and, and made this project happen. And first and foremost, that includes Archaeology Southwest, obviously. Um, and then uh, and, uh, my unit supervisors, two of whom are here in the back, Kathy and, and Leslie. Um, and then also all the field volunteers. And I see a few of you guys here. It's, it's weird coming in out of the field and actually talking with people because uh, the field is sort of like bank robber uh, apparel because you've got bandanas up to here and, and the big sunglasses and a floppy hat. So um, Jay I didn't recognize at all, and, and Carl and Fran are here, and, and Jack, and I don't know if there's any other people from the, from the field that, were, that are in here tonight, but if they are, apologies. Sherry, there we go. <laughs> and also, uh, a lot of people that were making this happen uh, weren't necessarily at Archaeology Southwest, but uh, were over at Desert Archaeology, and um, uh, like some, the preliminary lab processing that was done by Lisa and her crew was uh, really fundamental in helping us figure out what to do uh, day, uh, weekly by, week by week in the field. So today what we're gonna talk about is more on uh, the archeology span of ideas, I guess, on, on some level. It's, uh, we're gonna talk about how ideas spread, um, whether these ideas are resisted and, and what that might look like archeologically, and uh, how you can actually go about studying that. But to, do, to get to that part, we're gonna, I'm gonna have to lay a a couple of foundations, and the first foundation is actually myself, um, and it's a, it's a rickety foundation, so, so hang with me on that. Um, when I started in archaeology, well actually, the, my early background in archaeology is actually with uh, Chaco Canyon and, and, uh, and further south in the Mayan world. <laughs> but that wasn't actually my first experience with archaeology. I started out in uh, doing a couple of programs in high school in Wisconsin in archaeology, and the first one was a field trip to look at uh, a Ho-Chunk agricultural field. It was a maize field that was being excavated by an archaeologist. Um, and I remember being struck by uh, how exceedingly boring uh, that was. Um, and then the second experience was actually uh, at UW La Crosse um, analyzing blue, blue glass from historic farmsteads. And, and I, was, I was pretty uh, unimpressed with that, that experience also. And, and I, I, I told myself that there's no way I would ever go into archaeology. Um, clearly, I took a wrong turn somewhere. <laughs> but uh, here I am. Uh, anyway, so Chaco and, and the Mayan world are actually where I ended up after I told myself I wouldn't end up in archaeology. And uh, when you guys think about Chaco and especially uh, the Mayan world, and for me it was Copan, which is uh, this sort of fluorescence of art in the, in the Mayan world, uh, they're kind of you get these pictures of, of centers with no other players. So in a lot of the Southwest often, uh, especially when you're peripherally engaged with it, 
you see these areas like Mesa Verde, Chaco Canyon, the Northern Rio Grande, and a lot of them are, are kind of seem to be these centers with a lot of empty areas between them. And I found myself actually, having, after working in Chaco and, and Copan, wondering wh what's actually in these open spaces. And they turned out to be a lot less open than uh, our textbooks uh, would have us believe, although most archaeologists understand that they're, they're filled up, and most of you guys do too. Um, and so I started working in this region between uh, like the, the Mesa Verde Rio Grande and Chaco Triangle, and it's called the Gaina. Um, and I quickly realized that within these you know, quote unquote open spaces, there's a lot of social processes that are happening that we, we don't actually get to see when we're focused on the centers. And a lot of them, to me at least, end up being a bit more interesting than what we're seeing in, in, uh, in these centers. In the Guyana area itself, I ended up finding something uh, that I had interpreted as a multi-ethnic social movement, which was going against some of the earlier interpretations of the region as, as kind of a backwoods uh, hillbilly area. Um, but working within that and realizing that there's something very culturally and socially specific happening for these processes in which people are actively renegotiating and, and re-engaging with uh, surrounding peoples to, to start uh, a new lifestyle, essentially. I, I realized that there's a, there's a whole lot of cool stuff that we can study in archaeology by basically just looking at broken pieces of, of fired dirt. Um, and so that actually kind of got me into a position where uh, I decided to go to grad school, and, and that brought me to the U of A. And working with uh, Barbara Mills and Jeff Clark and, and Matt Peoples and Randy Haas building a, a large uh, database of the Southwest, and it's called the Southwest Social Network Database, which many of you may have actually heard presentations on before. Working at, within that environment uh, kind of solidified to me what can happen or what you can do by working with already existing collections. Um, and at that point, uh, a position for a new preservation fellow opened up. And, and reading it over, uh, it was uh, working with existing collections, which I'd, I'd become a a, a strong proponent of based on, on my previous research. And then also uh, looking at uh, groups outside of the, the, the Salado area um, who may or may not have been resisting the, the, the spread of this uh, ideology that's associated with Salado. And I realized that it was uh, pretty much uh, specifically written for me. Jeff claims it wasn't, but I'm, I'm not totally sure. <laughs> um, so I applied and, uh, and I got it, and, and, and now I'm here talking to you guys. And hopefully I'll write it up and get a dissertation out of it. Well, I'm told I have to. <laughs> the second foundation, so that's actually kind of how I came about getting into archaeology and, and the particular ideas are, that I became interested in, which is uh, resistance and, and uh, um, more peripheral, peripheral groups. I'm using scare quotes around periphery because it's a, it's a, a term that's, that's pretty loaded in, in, in archaeology and anthropology and just regular and, and general social research. Uh, but it's hard to come up with a better alternative. So that's how I ended up moving from way up north on the Colorado Plateau into uh, the southern research area, much like the Cayenta folk who eventually formed the, this, uh, uh, this spreading and inclusive socio-religious movement that archaeologically we call the Salado. So that's, that's our second foundation here, and this one's a lot more solid than, than my foundation. So we'll talk real quick about what the Salado are. Or I could just sit here quietly while you guys read the, the handouts, and we can, that, that might go quicker. <laughs> All right. So in the American Southwest, about uh, the late 1200s, uh, there was a pretty substantial migration that occurred. And it, it occurred there, uh, up on the Colorado Plateau, which fairly significantly emptied out um, based on the, the level of population that was, that was there prior to a uh, drought that occurred. Um, and thanks to the work of many people, and this includes Patty Crown and, and Patrick Lyons and Jeff Clark, uh, we know that a lot of these migrants were instrumental in, in forming a, a social religious movement uh, and, and a, a set of ritual practices that archaeologically we call Salado. Um, and, and I often call a socio religious movement myself just because it has. Um, it incorporates variables that are that are both religious as well as uh, uh, social. So it's it, it seems much more than one or the other. Um, within this movement, there's changes in in both how people were uh, 
interacting with each other and how people were using um, ceramics and in how people produce ceramics. Um, and it all gears back to this uh, migration of northern Pueblo groups off the Colorado Plateau. Post-1300 AD, from about 1300 to 1450 is, is when the Salado um, material culture really became solidified in terms of, of what it is. Around 1400 is when it really fluoresced, but the distinctive pattern that Salado really is uh, uh, primarily composed of, at least how a lot of us interact with it, is composed of rules about redware, um, all, which we also call Salado polychromes. Um, the imagery on these things is composed a lot of uh, rain and fertility imagery, and it's really kind of geared towards, um, or it's really, maybe I should rephrase that, it's not geared towards place base, which is a lot, what a lot of um, ritual practices within the Pueblo areas seem to be. Um, and that's part of the reason, I think at least, and I feel a, a few others do too, is that when we look at the spread of the of Salado material culture, it's a lot more uh, dynamic and, uh, than a lot of uh, the material culture associated with other um, practices in the, or ritual practices in the, in the Pueblo area. And it spreads very fast, and it spreads uh, across multiple groups, uh, which is rare. We don't often see that happen. Multiple groups, including the Ho'okam. We'll see associated changes um, in building structure and how ceramics are made, how they're decorated, um, also in terms of burial practices. About 100 to 150 years after that initial migration, uh, what we see in the southern southwest is dramatically different than what it looked like at 1300. So at 1300, we had areas that were uh, in the southern southwest, speaking of thinking Phoenix Basin, Tucson Basin, San Pedro, Safford Valley, um, that were very Ho'okam looking. Um, and that itself is uh, somewhat amorphous and can change depending on where you're at. But by the end of this, uh, we get this really kind of hybrid material culture that really looks a lot like stuff from the south uh, as well as things from the north, uh, both in terms of architecture and, and ceramics. And so we know that these groups are not only, these northern groups not only moved in and, and incorporated their um, religious practices, but they're, they're also modifying how uh, everyone's interacting with each other because we start to see uh, networks that spread across the entire southwest where everyone's interacting with each other, whereas prior to that, they're all regionally focused for the most part within the various valleys that we have down here. So one of the most important things to look at then in, in trying to understand what people may or may not have been or which people may or may not have been buying into um, what the northern migrants or the Salado were selling um, is to actually understand how ideas move and how ideas spread. The main reason for this is because, uh, uh, particularly for me, is I don't want to accidentally interpret uh, just pure distance from uh, a, a group or a, an idea or the origin, original source of an idea as resistance when it's simply not knowing about something. Um, so what I'm actually going to do here, and, and uh, I'll give us f uh, five or six minutes to do it, so I'm going to hand out um, some ideas to you guys to, to spread as you as you will. So I'm going to start one with Jay, then one with Jack, and I'm going to give you guys a slip of paper and just read it and keep it and then just pass the, the words down but keep the piece of paper. So it's kind of like, kind of like telephone. telephone. Yeah, all right. So kindergarten telephone. All right. Which one do I want to get? That one seems like a good one for Jay. That's, I'm not going to give you guys any more instructions than that. And this could fail spectacularly. That seems like a good one for Jack, too. And if it does, I'm going to blame that on, on, uh, on Jack. I'll blame it on Jack. All right. Jack's table tells me it's his fault. All right. You want, us to, you want me to, like, transmit this message? Yeah, transmit the message. You got it. I'm going to time it right now. I don't, we need, like, the Jeopardy theme or... There we go. <laughs> This is where there'll be a nice clip segment in the video. <laughs> okay, and we'll call it quits there. So everyone who heard the message, whether it was right or not, raise their hand. Okay, all right, so we kind of snaked through, huh? And I've noticed that when it got to the end of each table, uh, 
most people had to be pushed to move it to the next table. <laughs> and, and for instance, when it was down at that end, it didn't actually go, it went around the table instead of going back to the tables in the back. So I think what, one thing that we can really look at with this is that uh, transmission of ideas is really geographically constrained. Um, so it didn't actually uh, go from that table directly back, it actually just kept moving within the table. So when we're researching ideas or trying to figure out how things move in the past, it's, it's good to both understand uh, social connections, uh, which maybe is uh, uh, understanding friendships among these tables too, uh, as well as understanding uh, what the geography looks like under, underneath uh, those social connections. So you guys didn't make it a complete wreck, so thank you. <laughs> oh, what, what, was the, what was the end message? Who was the last one on this side? No one? Uh, never start things and never finish. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it was, uh, I think, never start a fight, or, but always finish it. Is that? Never start fights, always finish them. Never start fights, always finish them. All right. And on this side, what was the last one? Oh, that's perfect. That was, think, I think, exactly. Yeah, I'll see. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, none of the other tables told people to go away, so that's the other thing is, is uh, uh, which is what we'd be looking for with resistance. But they, uh, <laughs> that's that's also a good example of of how knowledge can get transmitted and and, and uh, messed up uh, through the process and. One of the interesting things about Salado is that uh, it seems to be produced in most of the communities that we find it. The message itself is strong enough that it doesn't seem to be getting messed up within the transmission, or it's, it's getting originally brought in by, by migrants, and the, the message is being retained without too much fluctuation through, through time. Although we do get changes in, in uh, ceramic type. But point being is, uh, the imagery on the ceramics seem to be associated with, uh, it's strong enough that it seems to transmit fairly easily also. Where was I? Okay, so we looked at how these ideas moved and how they, how they stalled through the, through the crowd. And, and uh, one thing that I'm sure at least some of you are, are thinking is, is, uh, is that's all good and great, but outside of the original pieces of paper uh, that I handed out, there's no way that we'd ever see this archeologically. <laughs> because uh, words are wind, and, and wind isn't excavated. Um, but, so how, how do we get about seeing ideas uh, through the archaeological record? Um, is, is one question that, that really needs to be asked, uh, and, and I'd hope you guys can answer it for me, because otherwise I'm kind of at an impasse for, for my work. <laughs> no, okay. Um, so we can't actually study ideas of resistance or ideas of ritual or ideas or of, of any type in a pretext context. We actually need to be able to look at uh, textual documents for that, except for the fact that uh, there's so many social cues embedded in material culture that it's actually a, a fairly decent inference to get to them. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, but one of the first things I really want to kind of talk about is how archaeologists have actually studied resistance before, and then I'll, I'll bring these two together. Resistance theory, as it's been used before, is actually pretty conducive to archaeological research because it's often been applied to groups who don't actually write their own history. Um, and since archaeologists primarily focus on groups who aren't actually writing their own history, the, the parallels seem, seem pretty nice. Um, and previous work has actually looked at, partially at, at how African slaves have fought against uh, dominant uh, ideology, usually colonial groups, uh, using ceramics and uh, utensils by creating like an autonomous uh, household. Um, we've also, they've also looked at how style and iconography, as well as uh, ceramic distribution, have um, demonstrated resistance in the Wari State down in the Andes. Um, and in the Southwest, we know that resistance can often take a, uh, 
um, the form of maintaining earlier settlement patterns as, as, as things change. Um, so settlement patterns that are more dispersed and resist uh, centralizing changes in hierarchy and power. Because of all of the ceramic cues that are embedded, or all of the social cues that are embedded in ceramics, it ends up being one of the most powerful ways, for, for me at least, that we can actually get at, at some of these unwritten cues of, of resistance in, in archaeology. And for me, it's not even necessarily the iconography uh, embedded in the ceramics, although that's important, um, and, nor is it the, necessarily the production technique. It's really just sort of how ceramics are distributed across the landscape. This really gets important when we look at, at how Salado is distributed because the, the ceramics themselves are really associated with uh, feasting rituals um, and large-scale feasting rituals. And we see through time that the, the pots, are, the bowls actually uh, get larger. And so we know the, the rituals or the feasts are, are getting, uh, are expanding um, in size. Um, and ritual feasts are always imbued with ideology of their own. So there's, there's one, two, three steps to, to get to a sort of non-material um, path. Um, but because the ceramics are imbued with, with uh, ideas on, on what supernatural life is like, how, how to actually functionally work within it to, to bring rain or fertility, uh, whatever the specifics of the Salado uh, uh, cult may have been, uh, because those ceramics are imbued with that, we can actually look at where they show up and where they don't show up to understand uh, people who may or may not have been um, interested in what those ceramics or that ideology has to say. We can also, beyond just looking at where where they don't show up, we need to look at where they should or where they uh, maybe should not show up. And that's where uh, this game with moving uh, ideas around the table kind of helps us understand that. We know, for instance, that that table back there, uh, I wouldn't expect these, if, if uh, this term was actually associated with, uh, it was a slotto pot moving that uh, with the ideas all, all wrapped up inside of it, I wouldn't expect to see it there. I would actually expect to see it over um, here instead of back there first, even though that's actually closer. So one of the first things we have to do is understand uh, social dynamics as well as environmental dynamics. To do that, uh, we actually looked at putting in three research transects, which you guys have a, a map here of that. And I, I apologize, it's very, uh, it, it doesn't show up very well. It's printed in black and white. Uh, but this is southern Arizona. Um, and we've got a, an eastern transect going over th here through the Sulphur Springs Valley as well as a uh, central transect going through the southern San Pedro, and then a uh, western transect going through the Tucson Basin out through the Coyote Mountains and the uh, Papagorea. By examining where the Salado material culture shows up originally uh, and where it has showed up in previous work and then comparing it where it has shown up in uh, archival collections, which many of these sites actually are archival collections that we're looking at, Garden Canyon in the San Pedro, uh, Baba Kamari, Roadrunner, Bokias, uh, they're all archival collections. Understanding what those ceramic assemblages look like in the archives um, allows us to, to start to get a preliminary picture. Um, the actual field work that we undertook uh, was focused on um, exclusively on the eastern and, and western transects, and it was primarily to fill in gaps in our understanding of how ceramics are distributed through these transects. And if you look at the who or what is Salado handout, you see this nice little polygon, the orange one, that has uh, Salado all out there. And what we're actually trying to do with these transects is cut across where that boundary might be and try and get sites within it and without it so that we can actually find out where the, the distributional edge of, of this of the ceramic uh, material culture, uh, which is associated with uh, this um, ideological phenomenon, might be. And one thing that we're able to do uh, pretty successfully, I think, was capture that in a, at least one of them, which is where we're expecting. Um, the Sulphur Springs Valley and the San Bernardino Valley I'll talk about in a second here. This was, uh, that's the eastern transect. Um, I'll talk first about what was going on in the Cowdy Mountains out here in the western transect. We see Salado polychrome uh, to some extent in the Tucson Basin. Um, and then 
the Cowdy Mountain sites that we're excavating at is that, that little bit of a mess right out here. Um, and there are four sites that we worked at out there. Um, and out of those four sites, there are five loci. And so it was four platform mounds and one compounds, and then one residential compound. So within those uh, five loci, we actually ended up with, I have exact counts, <laughs> uh, 4,309 sherds. And out of those, 400 and about 500, 496 were decorated ceramics. That's a little over 10%, which is, which is about, about right for that area. Out of those, out, out of the uh, almost 500 decorated ceramics, we had five, about five Salado ceramics. So, so clearly, uh, this area was, it was contemporaneous, and it wasn't actually uh, engaging uh, with the, the spread of this ideology or the material culture. The question then, of course, is to understand whether that is a product of uh, geographic dimensions or like environmental space or whether it's a product of, of social dimensions, which would be uh, the resistance. Um, the other area that we worked in archivally is uh, down in the San Pedro here. And I know based on the work that I, or the archives that I, or the, the ceramic counts that I've looked at for these areas, we see a, a bit of a transition early on where there should be Salado polychromes, and there aren't, especially at Baba Kamari Village, which is right here. And then later on, you start to see some. So these, these guys, up in the uh, northern San Pedro, uh, that's where previous work by Archaeology Southwest has been, and, and there's, a, there's a lot <laughs> of Salado up there. It's, it's what's been termed a landing zone. So the fact that the, the spread down there took so long is, is interesting in and of itself. But it, in some of these sites, it does get there, uh, especially Baba Kamari. It eventually gets there and, and ends up taking up 20% of their foreign ceramics, uh, which is actually a lot less in terms of the overall ceramics. It's like 0.8%, so it's really minimal, but these guys are interacting on, on some level. The eastern transect gets, uh, is, is just a crazy mess, and, <laughs> and it's supposed to be a crazy mess. We kind of knew it was going to be a crazy mess, uh, and it's, uh, it's a crazy mess partially because of what the area is, is labeled archaeologically. Uh, which is the Anamas phase, uh, which pretty much just means it's a whole mix of stuff. <laughs> it doesn't actually mean it's one thing or another. It's, it's, uh, it's like this really hybridized area where you get Mogion traits, you get Hohokam traits, you get Salado traits, and you get Southern traits from Casas Grandes, um, which, which means it's incredibly interesting, but it's also uh, very confusing to work at or work out what's happening. What we're looking at in that area is uh, it's, it's around, it, or it is exactly 1,649 shards that we, we pulled out of our, our uh, sampling units down there. And uh, 208 of those are decorated. Out of that 208, about 70% of them are Salado. So these guys are interacting with uh, Salado ceramics and the, and the ideology associated with it in a dramatically different way than people over in the West are. Um, but it actually, it gets, once you start changing scales in that area, it, it gets different too because some of the sites in there have almost no Salado component and others have a very heavy Salado component. So even within this area, it starts to get uh, very patchwork and, and people are, are interacting in a very different way to, to a lot of this. Part of the reason that we're hoping to get to, and, and this is all sort of in the future actions, is to try and figure out exactly why we're getting a patchwork environment out here and figure out whether what's happening in the central is a product of, of resistance or whether that's a product of more along the lines of distance decay, which would be geographic factors. Um, and then similar looking at what's going on past this boundary and whether that's simply uh, an act of resistance or distance decay factors. But considering where the centers of production are in a lot of these areas, the distance between these and between these ones, and down here was the last sites, or the second to last sites we're at, which had a very heavy Salado component, um, whereas over here uh, there's a very light Salado component. So simply geographically, that wouldn't explain the difference in, in uh, um, prevalence of, of Salado material culture at these various sites. So that's when we start to be able to get at and look at social components in terms of uh, people saying, you know, that's... That's not how we do things in this area. I think we can open it up for questions now.
could you talk a little bit about whether there's a relationship between the Kachina cult, which I thought was sort of northern based, the same area mm -hmm. as where the Salado ideology came, came down from? Yeah, um, so th they seem to be, it, in terms of direct relationship, I would say no. Um, what's happening is Salado is associated, we don't actually get that transmission down south of the, of the Kachina cult. We do see things down here that are, are somewhat similar to Kachina in terms of uh, modern uh, rituals that are practiced by uh, some of the descendant communities down here. Um, but, you know, some of the practices seem very similar, especially in terms of uh, how feasting is associated with them. Uh, but just in terms of the actual um, uh, specifics between the two, uh, you know, right now, just based on the, the lack of evidence that we have of actual um, Kachina imagery, uh, I would say that there's not an association. However, there's similar practices associated between the two, I guess. Um, in terms of the three research areas, I know you're sp really just looking at ceramics, but um, did you see any other patterning in material culture that made you start stop and say, hmm? Um, hmm. <laughs> yeah, so th there's actually, th th there's a, there's a lot more going on. Uh, we are also looking at uh, uh, like the obsidian distribution network, and so in in various areas, we're seeing uh, a, a large amount of obsidian, especially through the Sulphur Springs Valley area and the Cowdy Mountains. We're getting like one to two flakes per site, I think. Um, we're also in the Cowdy Mountains getting a, a huge amount of of shell. Um, objects. We weren't getting, this, uh, again, we're, we're excavating only in trash mounds. One of the, the ethics of preservation ar archaeology is to leave as light of a, a footprint on the, on the archaeological record as you possibly can. And so that involves uh, avoiding architecture whenever, whenever possible. Anyone who's been out in the field knows that it's not always possible. Sometimes you just drop down on a, on a floor. And then I, I say bummer, and then everyone gets really excited. <laughs> um, but uh, so what we weren't seeing uh, in, in the Cowdy Mountains, we weren't seeing a lot of evidence of shell uh, production, but there's certainly uh, a lot of shell out there, and we weren't seeing that in the Sulphur Springs Valley. So there's, uh, there's variable changes in how people are using uh, different material. Um, so obsidian, uh, shell, we're getting turquoise at all the sites, which was, which was interesting, I wasn't necessarily expecting. Um, then we also started to get some, some random uh, objects that uh, are, are, are fun, like uh, groove plummets and, and such, but uh, not, not a whole lot of... Uh, what, we, what we were hoping for in some of the sites uh, were the perforated plates, which are another uh, really good marker of uh, Salado ceramic production, and we didn't actually get any of those. Or we, if we have, we haven't noticed them yet. I think Lisa would have yelled at us if we'd, if we'd gotten one. Um, but yeah, so the, the biggest surprise uh, was again the, the Sulphur Springs Valley in terms of variability between sites, especially ones that are right next to each other. Um, some will have obsidian, uh, or the percentage of obsidian in their, in their, in their lithic assemblage will be upwards of, of 20% per site, and, and a site that's only about four miles away from there will, will have like four uh, flakes of obsidian. So, and those have actually been inverse to uh, the amount of salado in the, in the decorated ceramic assemblage, which is interesting because increases in obsidian is usually associated with, uh, with the increase in salado ceramics on sites too. So they're usually um, inter, inter, interlinked very strongly and, and these areas are they're kind of mixed up. Of your, of your salado ceramics, uh, are they all uh, made in one place? Are some locally made, some imported? Uh, the spread of Salado is pretty broad, yeah, and there's yeah. a lot of variability there, yeah. and that might affect the uh, degree of uh, resistance that, mm -hmm. uh, that's involved. Yeah, they've, uh, a lot of the sourcing studies that have been done on Salado ceramics have actually demonstrated that they're, they're, most of them are locally made within the communities that they're found. Um, there's going to be a sourcing component to this study, too, so that's, that's something that we'll f find out, but if, if the pattern holds from from past patterns, uh, Patty Crown, I think, had found this in her in her book about from uh, uh, she's almost 20 years ago now, I guess, um, that that was generally the case, and I think that's been that's been held up. So it's usually more a product of 
of villages making making the salado instead of just the, the the pot spreading out. One of the things that's always impressed me is the nature of the salado ceramics or the northern border mm -hmm. of their distribution. All of a sudden, they they lose that freewheeling kind of character that the painting has, and the painting starts getting very uptight, uh, like uh, many of the uh, Anasazi mm -hmm. black and white types. And it, it seems to me that uh, if you find something like that, that could be an interesting uh, a contribution to the question of acceptance versus uh, Resistance. Yeah, yeah, and actually, you know, that brings up a lot of other interesting ideas within uh, the temporal span of of Salado too, because there's ideas that the the earlier uh, bowls, which still would have been associated with similar feasting rituals, are smaller, and the decorations uh, always on the inside, and the the Salado uh, ceramic exterior. Do we? It's all. It's this is a, a tonno polychrome, so it's it's hard to tell, but the. The bowls are just red on the outside, and all through the south, um, there's a very strong redware um, component to, to most sites. So if you're just looking at the exterior of the ceramics, they would look just like every other bowl that's, that's made out there. And when you start seeing inside them is when they, they get different. And people have, have, have made the argument that uh, the reason that it's just decorated on the inside is that it's, 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 they themselves are trying to hide what's happening. But, Clearly that ends, if that is the case, it ends at some point because it starts spreading so, so rapidly. But any, uh, a lot of the environmental and, or the, a lot of the social uh, norms that are kind of encoded into these ceramics as they change is when it gets interesting. You're right, that would be, be interesting to see. It's my understanding that the Kayenta left north, mm -hmm. came south because of drought. They're following the San Pedro. The San Pedro runs, there's lots of water. And why would they be induced to leave the, the watered area to come west to the Coyote Mountains, for example, that, that's basically an unknown and, and probably pretty dry? Why would they not stay within the San Pedro Valley, Sulphur Spring Valley, where there's water? To me, that would be a, not a societal resistance, but um, a resistance to leave an area that's wet, where they've come from an area that's very dry. Sure. Um, yeah, and, and you know that's the one thing that's important to understand about how salado material culture moves is it's not actually indicating. It's not at the beginning. It's indicating uh, where the northern migrants have shown up, but after that, it's not. And after that, we're actually seeing a lot of this material culture in areas that wouldn't necessarily have like the original migrants. So it might be later groups moving, but it's less about people and material culture moving and more about how ideas are moving. So we wouldn't necessarily expect people from the San Pedro to have moved to the Cowdy Mountains, but the ideas encoded in their, in their ritual practices would have made the transition, and that's, that's more what we're looking at. And uh, one of the things that you can really see that really pulls that out is when you start looking at the social networks of, uh, for instance, the Kayenta were really enclosed within their own group in, in the north before the, the migration. And that may have very well, a lot of the groups that actually were able to persist up in that area, like the Hopi, or I shouldn't say a lot, there's only two up there. Um, the, the Hopi had this really uh, dispersed um, social network that allowed them to draw on a whole bunch of variety of, of regional resources as, as their local ones were, were failing. And the Kayenta didn't have that. And, uh, I think one understanding of, of what's happening is that they realized that that was a, a poor strategy. And this may have been their way to, one, incorporate themselves uh, within the, within the, with the local groups, as well as, as buffering themselves against poor years. So as it spread out, people were also possibly realizing that it was a more effective um, buffering strategy, I guess. Hey, John. Thanks. Hey, Lewis. Great presentation. Uh, so. You mentioned that you are looking at these sample units from the trash mounds, and I'm just curious, mm -hmm. and you also mentioned that you either have looked or maybe will look at some legacy collections, some stuff that people made a long time ago. Yeah. Have you get any results on the comparisons of those, like what it looks like compared to, I don't know, either surface collections that have been made or what you saw on the surface be, be compared to the trash mounds? Yeah, so, uh, so far the only 
comparisons we've made between surface collections and, uh, and excavation material has been pretty consistent. That was in the Coyote Mountains. Um, there's a few things that were, that were, and that wasn't actually from that long ago. That was just a um, late 80s, I guess, mid 80s. Um, and that was primarily, you know, very few uh, Salado ceramics and, and uh, a large majority of, of locally produced uh, ceramics like Cells Red and, and then uh, Tonka Verde Red on Brown stuff. So, so far that's actually correlated pretty nicely. Um, we haven't actually done that yet with any of the stuff in, in the East, uh, but we're actually in process of re-examining some of the, the previously uh, <laughs> processed ceramic collections. And we're, we're finding even, uh, we're finding some differences in specifics between uh, how they were, uh, or the distribution of ceramics within them. Uh, but in general, it's, it's, it's showing pretty consistent patterns from like 19, uh, 80s to, to now. And actually, that's another thing I should mention too, that, that these groups are actually interacting with trash in a, in a completely different way. So in the Coyote Mountains, I think I, we had like 5,000 ceramics that we'd, we'd recovered. Um, and they've got these really nice trash mounds <laughs> that, just, that has like a neon sign saying dig here. And in the Sulphur Springs Valley, uh, erosion is a big issue down there. So if there were any little mounded areas, it was it was pretty, uh, pretty heavily hit, but they also oftentimes were disposing of their trash in their, in their architecture, which we're avoiding, so it can be, it can be hard to, to get a good sample, which we did get a good sample of everything, so. <laughs> but it was, it was a lot more frustrating. As you were talking, I was just, it just sort of came back to me, and maybe, um, maybe Dr. Thompson would comment on this, but I was just thinking, gosh, you know, I have this recollection of hearing that that one of the reasons for selecting work at Grasshopper Pueblo was because uh, Dr. Howery thought that it was a Salado site. And that was because there was a reasonable amount of Salado on the surface, but mm -hmm. once they started um, putting holes into it, there was almost none there. Yeah. And so that, that's where I, I just, as you're, as you're talking about that. So um, uh, I'm wondering if the sites that you're looking at you know, you've been asked about the material culture, whether or not sites even close to one another actually look like one another, even though they have real different ceramic components, like is the architecture, the layout, whatever else you got um, about the sites also looking similar. Yeah, it's in, in the Sulphur Springs Valley area, that's, that's a difficulty for sure. And it's, it's all wrapped up into that Animas phase stuff, which, so we can get uh, sites that um, look like a whole com uh, compound with uh, like a room block all the way around. We'll also get ones where it's just linear room arrangements where it's not in an actual in an actual square. One of the sites that we had down there did actually have a fairly uh, significant Salado component written in on the site card, and we only got like four sherds out of the site. Um, but there weren't actual counts on the site card. But yeah, there's a lot of variability in architecture down there. So that, that, could, that could possibly play into it. Fascinated with your concept of uh rejection or resistance, mm -hmm. how are you going to differentiate between a situation where the ideological strength of the Salado just ran out of steam yeah. somewhere along the yeah. line versus the local people are, are rejecting it? There's, there's a very difficult arena there that I don't know how archaeology is going to solve that. It, it is, and if, <laughs> if I, can, I, can, I can definitely go into it. <laughs> um, but uh, at the short answer is that there's archaeologists have really done a good job of looking at distance decay models of how technology moves across space, especially uh, stuff Hotter had done in the in the 70s and 80s. Um, and sociologists have done a really good uh, job of looking at how ideas spread through communities. Um, so for this, what I really want to do is is actually combine the two and look both at. I guess I've got a. But look both at how um, ideas move through a community of people, as well as how they actually may move, we're going to call this topography here, um, uh, through space. And then, so incorporating those two, um, hopefully I'll be able to understand differences both in, or if there are, say, material culture that's missing from 
that's present here. And present here, but missing from here, it's a result of uh, geographic constraints and not of social constraints. Um, so, I mean, that's the, the main thing that I'm worried about is, is misinterpreting resistance as distance decay or, or simply geographic constraints. So, so that'll, that, that's, how, that's simply how I'm, I'm going to parse it out. But. Okay. Yeah, last quick chance for questions? All right, well, thank you all for coming tonight. It was a great talk. <laughs> <laughs>